Diffie-Hellman's sole purpose is to facilitate a key exchange. But did you know that there's a way of doing Diffie-Hellman that ensures that whatever you encrypt with keys derived from Diffie-Hellman remains encrypted forever? It is quite possibly the most misunderstood concept in cryptography, but it is supremely important. Let's talk about it. The goal of any key exchange is to allow two users to establish a shared secret despite anybody listening in on their conversation. We're going to show you how Diffie-Hellman accomplishes this goal. And we're actually going to show this to you twice. Despite this being a crypto essentials course, I went back and forth on whether I should show you the real math that goes on in Diffie-Hellman. On one hand, the nerd in me loves the math, thinks it's fascinating, and thinks it's really cool to see. On the other hand, I know most folks don't really need to understand Diffie-Hellman to that level. But for those of you that did, I wanted to make sure to include that in this lesson. So I'm going to show you Diffie-Hellman twice. First, I'm going to show you Diffie-Hellman using simplified math. And then I'm going to talk about that thing I alluded to in the intro about keeping something encrypted forever. And then finally, I'm going to show you a clip from my SSL and TLS deep dive course where I show you the math behind the Diffie-Hellman algorithm. So you have that to look forward to. With that said, let's get into talking about Diffie-Hellman. The thing you have to understand about Diffie-Hellman is that it's an algorithm that can only be used for a key exchange. There's no such thing as Diffie-Hellman encryption or no such thing as Diffie-Hellman signatures. When you're thinking of Diffie-Hellman, think just of key exchanges. And what I'm about to show you is a simplified version of Diffie-Hellman between this green and blue user. It's going to start by both of these peers agreeing upon a mutual starting value. This is done publicly, so our red user gets a hold of this number as well. In our example, this starting value is going to be 27. Then our users are going to independently generate a private value. In this case, the green user is generating the number 11 and the blue user is generating the number 35. This is a private value and therefore is never going to be shared. Then our users are going to use that private value and the starting value to generate a public value. For our example, our combination is just going to use addition, but real Diffie-Hellman uses something a little bit more complex. We'll talk about it shortly. So our green user is going to add 27 with its private value of 11 to get a result of 38. Our blue user is then going to do the same thing. They're going to add 27 plus 35 to get us the value of 62. And since this value is a public value, it's meant to be shared across the wire to the peer. So the green user will share 38 across the wire, and the blue user will share 62 across the wire. Now our red user, acting as our man in the middle, saw these values as they crossed the wire, which means the red user also has a copy of 38 and 62 sent by the green and the blue user. Keep that in mind. And finally, the last step of Diffie-Hellman is for each of our peers to combine their private value, which was never shared, with their peer's public value, which was shared in the last step. So our green user is going to take 11, their private value, and combine it with 62, the public value shared by the blue user. We'll again just use addition, and 11 plus 62 gets us 73. Our blue user will then do the same thing. They'll add 35 plus 38 to get also 73. And once we have that shared secret on both sides, we can use that to generate any amount of symmetric secret keys that we want to encrypt data between the green and the blue user. So that's the basic premise of Diffie-Hellman. And understand the assurance that Diffie-Hellman provides. Diffie-Hellman assures that these values shared in public cannot be combined in such a way as to recreate the shared secret of 73. Now, we were using simplified math by combining things using only addition. There is a way, technically, to combine these numbers in order to get 73. But understand Diffie-Hellman uses something else. Diffie-Hellman uses modular exponentiation. That allows us to do a calculation where we can share publicly the result, but still have the initial values hidden. And I'll show that to you shortly. For now, I just want to reiterate that this is a simplification. Even though Diffie-Hellman follows these steps, it doesn't combine values with mere addition. Earlier, I told you something about keeping things encrypted forever, and that's what I want to talk about next. It has to do with these private values. Remember, these private values were instrumental in the calculations in order to attain the shared secret of, in this case, 73. There's a way of doing Diffie-Hellman such that those values are ephemeral. Ephemeral meaning they are deleted after they are used. The idea there is once this green user has calculated 73, he'll make sure to purge all of these numbers from memory. The blue user will do the same thing. Once they have calculated 73, the blue user is going to delete all of these numbers. The numbers are never written to a file, they're never written to a database, they're never stored, they're purged instantly after the calculation has been done. 
Our red user, of course, acting as our man in the middle, still has a copy of those numbers. But that's okay, because remember, the assurance of Diffie-Hellman is that these numbers cannot be combined in such a way as to recreate this number. The numbers you need to recreate that number is one of these private values, which are ephemeral and deleted from memory. What this does is it makes it so that there's no longer a value that exists that can be used to recalculate the shared secret. The only way to get the shared secret is to brute force that key. And remember, every key is brute forceable. So as long as you're using a key space or a number space that's big enough that it would take you thousands and thousands and thousands of years to brute force those keys, what you encrypt with keys derived from this shared secret effectively stay encrypted forever. This provides a very important cryptographic principle known as forward secrecy. Forward secrecy asserts that it is impossible to recreate whatever values you're using to create secret keys. Remember that RSA as a key exchange does not provide forward secrecy because with RSA, the private key file still exists. And if that private key file is ever compromised, you can use that to extract the seed value and recalculate the shared secret. You don't have that with Diffie-Hellman so long as you're doing it with ephemeral values. Since these values literally no longer exist after the calculation is done, it is now impossible to recalculate the shared secret. All you can do is brute force that secret. That's the idea behind forward secrecy. Forward secrecy is the reason that Diffie-Hellman is regarded as more secure than RSA as a key exchange. It is the reason why Diffie-Hellman is highly recommended in all secure communications protocols like SSL and TLS. Okay, so that is the basic premise of Diffie-Hellman, and that's really all you need to know if all you're interested is the essentials of cryptography. For the rest of you, however, I want to go a bit further on Diffie-Hellman because it's really cool to see it in action, and it proves to you that it works the way everybody says it does. Earlier, I mentioned that Diffie-Hellman uses modular exponentiation for its number combinations. There's two parts of that, and I'm going to explain them to you both, starting with exponentiation. Exponentiation is raising something to the power of something else. For instance, you could take 7 and raise it to the power of 2. That's the same thing as doing 7 times 7, which gets you 49. You could take 3 and raise it to the fourth power. That's doing 3 times 3 times 3 times 3, which gets you 81. Or you can take 9 and multiply it with itself 5 times, and that'll get you 59,049. Notice how quickly you can get to very, very big numbers with exponentiation, even though you're starting with relatively smaller numbers. So that's exponentiation, but now let's talk about modular. Modular is simply doing remainder division. For example, if I ask you to solve for 49 mod 6, what I'm asking you to do is tell me the remainder, what you're left over with, if you divide 49 by 6. Well, 6 can go into 49 8 times evenly, that'll get you to 48, which leaves you with 1 as the remainder. 81 mod 6 will get you 3 as a remainder, and 59,049 mod 6 will also have to get you 3 as the remainder. Now, notice, both of these resulted in the same remainder of 3. And so if you knew the result of this operation was 3, and even if you knew that we used mod 6 in this operation, there's no way to really know what I started with. Notice, knowing this does not reveal anything about what you started with. This is what I was mentioning earlier, that Diffie-Hellman does number combinations in a way that even if you see the result, you still don't know what you started with. That's a result of modular exponentiation. And in fact, many other cryptographic algorithms also use modular exponentiation. Okay, now it's time to actually get into the real math of Diffie-Hellman. And you're gonna see everything we just discussed all come together in the next few minutes. This next clip is from my practical TLS course, which is a deep dive into SSL and TLS. And I'm just going to show you the few minutes where I go into explaining the Diffie-Hellman math and showing to you with a real example between two parties. So enjoy this next clip. I'll see you on the other side. We're going to do Diffie-Hellman together using Alice and Bob. All the math that Alice is going to do is going to be included in this blue box, and all the math that Bob is going to do is going to be included in this orange box, and anything that happens in the middle, everybody knows about it that might have been listening in on the wire. So here is how Alice and Bob are going to establish a shared secret. First, they're going to agree upon two numbers, a prime number and a generator of that prime number. For our example, we're going to use 13 as our prime and 6 as our generator. We're going to call these values P and G. Then Alice and Bob are each going to independently randomly generate a private key. For the sake of this example, Alice is going to generate randomly the number 5 and Bob 
randomly generated the number 4. They're then going to use their private values in combination with these values to calculate their public key. They're going to take the generator, in this case 6, raise it to their private values, 5 and 4 respectively, and then figure out the remainder when divided by 13. So Alice will do this calculation. She's going to take 6 and raise it to the fifth power, then she'll figure out the remainder when divided by 13. That gets her an answer of 2. Bob is going to do the same thing, except he's going to use his own private value. He's going to take the generator, 6, and raise it to his private value of 4, then figure out the remainder when divided by 13, and that's going to get him 9. Now that both parties have these public values, they're then going to exchange these public values with one another. Anybody listening in on the wire will also hear what these public values are. Then Alice and Bob are going to combine the public value that was shared with their private values to finally attain the shared secret. So from Alice's perspective, this is what she's going to do. She's going to take 9, which was Bob's public value, and raise it to the fifth power, which is her private value. Then she's going to figure out the remainder when divided by 13, which was our prime number, and the result of that is 3. Bob is now going to do the same thing, and hopefully he is also going to land on the number 3. He's going to take 2, which was Alice's public value, raise it to the fourth power, which was his own private value, and then figure out the remainder when divided by 13. The result of that will also be 3. Notice, Alice and Bob landed on the same shared secret, the number 3, and anybody else listening in on the wire will have only heard the numbers 13 and 6, and 2 and 9, and there's no way to combine 2, 9, 6, and 13 consistently to get the shared secret of 3. That is the Diffie-Hellman exchange. So there you have it. That's how Diffie-Hellman works. And I hope some of you appreciated seeing the actual math of the Diffie-Hellman key exchange. I know for me that a lot of this didn't really click until I actually saw the math, so I hope for some of you the same thing just occurred. In any case, the main takeaways from this lesson is understanding what the purpose is of the Diffie-Hellman key exchange, and that it allows two parties to establish a shared secret over an unsecured medium. It is the foundation of almost any secure communication protocol in the world today, so it is a critical part of the modern security landscape. Thank you for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next one.